back. Amen. Woo. Thank you, Ron, and the praise team. Tell you what, got me all worked up into a sweat this morning singing that one. Woo. One day he's coming back again. Amen. Living, he loved us, died, he saved us. Well, he's coming back again. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. Amen. He is a risen Lord. And we're excited to have you with us here this morning. Pastor Robbie is leading the uh, youth out for their service in the lower level. And uh, they can go ahead and follow him out. If you have your a bulletin inside, that's your sermon notes. If you want to grab that this morning, as we always say, uh, we encourage you to write notes and take notes. And uh, if you write it, you can retain it and you can use it. If you don't write it, you cannot retain it and you cannot use it. You'll forget almost everything I say this morning in this entire time together if you don't write it down. So we always encourage you to write things down as we go throughout our sermon and our study time together. It is an exciting day around here, and we are beginning our 21-day fast corporately as a church family, and our 21 days of prayer will be coupled together with that each day from 4 p.m. to 6.30. As we said earlier this morning, you can Feel free to come by the church anytime during those hours and spend some time in prayer, meditation, uh, however the Lord would lead you during that time. And to help give us a better understanding of why we're doing a church-wide fast and prayer time, I thought it would be helpful to speak about fasting and prayer this morning. Some of you are perhaps new to our congregation, and uh, this may be the first time you've heard about fasting or doing a church-wide fast, and it may be new to you. Maybe you came from a church uh, tradition where fasting was not part of that church tradition, and that doesn't make it right or wrong or good or bad. It just wasn't part of the tradition that you perhaps came out of or were raised in. And so we want to talk to you this morning about that. In the Gospel of Mark, we read the following. It says, the disciples of John, that would be John the Baptist, and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they, who is they? They are the disciples of John and the Pharisees. Then the disciples of John and the Pharisees came and said to him, said to Jesus, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now we know that John the Baptist ate a strange diet while he was here on the earth. The Bible says he ate locust and wild honey. That was his diet. That's what he ate. We know that the Pharisees, uh, from studying history, fasted very often, and they made a spectacle of their fasting. They wanted to be seen fasting. They had many fasts that they had to participate in. And so the disciples of John, who probably ate a diet similar to John's, and the Pharisees, who were religious fasters, came and said, Jesus, why? Do John's disciples fast, and why do the Pharisees fast, and yet your disciples do not fast? And then Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? Now, if we don't know our Bible, this doesn't make any sense to us, that statement right there. So we have to go back to John chapter 3, verse 29, and John the Baptist called Jesus the bridegroom. He said, the bridegroom is coming. And so Jesus said, can the friends of the bridegroom, that would be his disciples, can they fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Now this is just simply a reference to the Jewish marriage feast in which there was eating and drinking and dancing. It was a time of joy and excitement. And Jesus said, as long as the bridegroom is with them, the the groomsmen will not fast because it is a time to rejoice. It is a time to enjoy. It's a time to have a good time with the bridegroom. But then look what he says. But the days will come when the bridegroom, who is Jesus, will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. The time will come when the bridegroom, in a reference to his death and ultimately his ascension back to heaven. The time will come when the bridegroom, I, Jesus, will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Jesus knew that there would come a time when he would not physically be present any longer with his disciples or with his church. And when that time came, Jesus said that his disciples, that his 
church, his followers, would need a supernatural strength. And he makes the statement, then they will fast. Then they will fast. I believe today that on January the 3rd, 2016, we are living in those days. Jesus, the bridegroom, is physically absent from us. And I believe that many of us in this room this morning would have to agree that we need a spiritual power in our lives to live and to stand in the days in which we find ourselves right now. We need a supernatural power. And yet, how do we find that power and that strength? And Jesus says it only comes through prayer and fasting. So today, the Harvest Ministries Church is joining together in a 21-day corporate Daniel fast. A Daniel fast is a partial fast. We'll begin today and continue through January the 24th. And we'll break our fast on that morning with communion together as a church family. Now, we've been talking about this fast. We've been promoting this fast. We've had things in our bulletin, and you've seen all kinds of things about this fast. We've done our very best to try to spread the word about what we're doing over the next 21 days. The Daniel fast simply comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1, we read about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had been captured and taken into captivity. They were young, intelligent men. They were able to... Uh, do great things in captivity. But a time came when Daniel said, we need to make a stand for our God. And in order to do this, we don't want any of the food from the king's table. Now, you have to think in this day, the king's table had some really good food on it. I mean, it had the best of the best. We don't want any of the king's food, but yet we want to eat a special diet. We want to eat fruits and vegetables. We're only going to drink water we're going to do that for 10 days. The Bible says at the end of that 10-day period, from only eating fruits and vegetables and drinking water, that Daniel and his friends looked healthier and better nourished than the people who had been eating from the king's table. And so this morning we have outlined what we would like you to do during this fast. When you leave church today, I want you to leave here and I want you to go somewhere and eat whatever it is that you want to eat. I mean, you just eat it, and you eat a lot of it. Now, some of you have already began doing this as well as I have already began doing this. I had Chick-fil-A for lunch yesterday because I know Daniel didn't eat any Chick-fil-A. And I went and had Mexican last night because I know Daniel didn't eat any Mexican on his diet. And I went to Starbucks late last night, and I got me a pumpkin latte, because I know Daniel didn't have any pumpkin latte like Lee's got over there right now. So I've just been eating. Many of you told me you've been eating all kinds of foods and baking things and making things, trying to get that last bit in you before you start this fast. So go out today, eat whatever you want to eat for lunch, and then once lunch is over today, you just are on a liquid fast from the rest of the day on until tomorrow night at dinner time or supper time, whatever you may call it in your family. Tomorrow night at dinner, you begin to introduce pure foods of vegetables and fruits into your body. Now, on our back table, there are several flyers that will give you a list of foods that you should eat, a list of foods to avoid. There's also several recipes printed out for you to look at and take home and to try those recipes. Basically, we just ask you during this 21 days to take some common foods that you normally would eat and replace them and remove them from your diet and put some good and better foods into your diet. Now, there's a website you can check out if you'd like to get online, simply www.daniel-fast.com. There's all kinds of recipes and information on that website about the Daniel Fast, and we encourage you to go there and read about it and look at it for yourself. Of course, we want you to use wisdom during the fast. If there is a legitimate physical reason that would prevent you from fasting, uh, and let me say this, God knows whether you got a legitimate reason or not, okay? You know, we can all use that excuse. My sugar drops low if I don't eat, you know. I got to eat 12 donuts every day or my sugar drops low. <laughs> no, that's probably not the case, you know. 
But some of you have legitimate reasons you physically maybe can't fast. So if you are in a position where you can't do it for physical reasons, we would ask you to give up something like technology, some type of technology perhaps. Maybe you're on Facebook, or maybe you're online all the time, and you say, you know what, I'm going to fast this for 21 days. Or maybe there's a specific food that you really like, you really eat that, that's something you focus on. Maybe you say, for the next 21 days, I can give that up. Or you may, you may just say, you know what, Pastor, I know I cannot stick to this Daniel fast, the way you have it outlined for 21 days, but I can sacrifice and give something up and whatever that is for you, you've got to figure that out for yourself. But I can give something up for God. But I really want to encourage you to, to do the Daniel fast if at all possible. See, whenever we read about a fast in the Bible, it's followed by a time of growth and blessing. And I believe that as you commit to this fast, you will usher in the blessings and the power of God in our lives and in the life of our church as well. I believe over the next 21 days that miracles are going to happen. I believe that prayers are going to be answered. I believe that situations are going to be changed, that strongholds are going to be broken, and what the enemy has taken from you, I believe over the next 21 days, God is able to restore that back into your life. And we see the power of prayer and fasting found in a passage of Scripture from the book of Matthew chapter 17. In this chapter, Jesus has taken his inner circle with him. He's taken Peter, James, and John. These are his inner circle. These are the ones that were closest to Jesus. And he takes them to the mountain, the Bible says. And while he is there on the mountain, the Bible says that Jesus was transfigured. And that's a strange word we don't use a lot in our modern everyday conversation is the word transfigured. But basically, God himself came down. And the Bible says Moses showed up and Elijah showed up. And Jesus had a conversation with them. And we don't know what that conversation was exactly all about, but they had a conversation about something. And the Bible says that God spoke and said, this is my son. And as the spirit lifted off of Jesus, he glowed, physically glowed from the presence and the power and the anointing of God. There was something that happened there on that mountain. In fact, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration. We kind of equate that to the bright light that the shepherds saw that night on the hillside where the angel, the glory of the Lord, shone round about them, the King James says. There was a bright light and a glorious light and it lit up everything around them. It was almost that same kind of light, the glory and the power of God. And the disciples, Peter, James, and John, knew that they had been in the very presence of God. And it was such a great moment and it was such a powerful moment that they wanted to build an altar right there for Moses and Elijah to, to represent what had happened there on that mountain. The glory of God. I believe as we enter into this 21 days of prayer and fasting, we will experience some of that glory of God that we will be different, we will be changed, that things will have a different outlook, that life will look better than it's looked ever before as we enter into the glory and the presence of God. There's something different about us. My mind goes back to the Old Testament, to the priest, and to the tabernacle. As the priest would go into that, that tabernacle, he would carry incense with him. And it would light the fires, and, and the incense would send up this glorious smell before the presence of God. But something else happened in that tabernacle. As the priests lit the fires, not only did the smell of the incense rise up to heaven, but it also got onto the priest himself, and it got into his clothing, and it got into the fibers of the garment that he wore. And so as that priest would leave the tabernacle, leave the presence of God, as he walked through the camp, you didn't even have to see him walk past you. You could just do, the priest has been in the presence of God. I smell the presence of God. I smell the glory of God. And I wonder how long it's been since anybody has smelled the glory of God on you. I wonder how long it's been since they've smelled the presence of God in your life 
and in my life. I wonder how long it's been since they haven't seen nasty, mean, ornery attitudes, and yet they've seen the power and the love and the glory and the presence of God coming forth out of our lives and say, oh, there's something different about that person. They've been in the presence of God. I have told you this for almost 12 years. This February 29th will be 12 years I've been at this local church as your pastor. Last night as I ate my Mexican chimichangas, the waitress came over who happens to know my son and my daughter, and we talked about church. There was another church group in there, and she's made this statement. Church people are the worst people to wait on. And I preached that from this pulpit for years. I've told y'all that when you leave this building about to eat today, be nice to your servers. And she said they're the worst people to wait on. I hate to see Sunday come. They're mean. They're nasty. They're ornery. They don't leave a good tip. They expect everything. They demand everything. And they don't want to give us anything in return. And I said, you got about right. Now, if a waitress who I maybe she's saved or not saved can pick up on that, What do other people pick up on that we come in contact with? I believe over the next 21 days, our lives will be changed and transformed by the power of God. I believe through prayer and fasting, we will see God do things in our lives and through our lives and through our church that we have never experienced before. And if you will commit to pray and to fast, God will show up, and God will do something great in your life. So Jesus is on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. They come off of the mountain after this great experience, and they find a large crowd waiting for them, and they find the need. There is a father who has a son who had brought his son to the disciples while Jesus was on the mountain. They hoped that the disciples could cure the son of a sickness that he had. He was epileptic. He had seizures. In fact, the Bible says that the father said every now and then when he had a seizure, he would fall. He had fallen into the fire sometimes. Sometimes he had fallen into some type of water, and they had to rescue him. But the disciples of Jesus could not meet the need of this father and of this son. It was beyond their ability. It was beyond their human strength and their spiritual strength. And no matter what they attempted, they were unable to deal with this. Many of us here this morning have served the Lord for some time. And we found ourselves in a situation that no matter what we've tried, with everything inside of us, we could not find the answer for ourselves or for our friend or for our loved one who was in need. We tried everything that we could think of. We have exhausted all of our spiritual resources, and still the need is unmet in that life. The person is still sick, or the situation remains unchanged, or that person is still unsafe. So what do we do? We think about Jesus and his disciples as they came down from the mountain. They had been in the very presence of God. And can I just say this, that in the presence of God, everything feels perfect in the presence of God. Just something about being in his presence. It seems like the possibilities are unlimited when you're in the presence of God. But now as Jesus and Peter and James and John come down from the mountain and being in the presence of God, where everything is great, they come face to face with the grim reality of life. And that happens when we come together sometimes in church. Maybe it's a powerful service. Maybe it's a very quiet move of the Spirit of God. Maybe it's a very peaceful service that you're sitting in or whatever it may be, and you feel yourself in the very presence of God. And you feel as though God has strengthened you and God has emboldened you and God has given you what you needed for that very moment. And there are some times when you leave the service and you think, I could take on every demon of hell right now. I feel so good. And you leave the service. And sooner or later, You get back into the real world. You're confronted with real problems and real situations. 
to confront it with a person that you've been praying for or the thing that you've been praying about and nothing seems to have changed and yet you were just in the very presence of God. And it's almost as though the wind is leaving your sails and you get back into the real world. And I want to thank God this morning that Jesus is the master of all needs in our lives. If you have a need in your life today and you don't have an answer, if you've got a need that you've been praying for, if you've got an unsaved family member, if you're facing an impossible situation, I declare to you this morning through the word of God that your hope is in Jesus Christ and nobody else because nothing is too hard for our Savior today. And so here is Jesus, the Son of God, coming from this great mountain experience, facing a young man who has epilepsy. The disciples can't help him. They can't do anything about it. The Bible says, Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very moment. In an instant, Jesus spoke into that boy's life, and it changed his life and his situation forever. What seemed impossible was now accomplished in his life. You see, when all of our resources are gone, Jesus reaches out his miracle-working hand, and supernatural power flows from the hand of God. When we've done all that we can do, when we've exhausted everything that we have, there is supernatural power flowing from the hand of Jesus. So now there's no longer a need. The boy has been healed. The demon has been cast out of him. He is well. Epilepsy is gone. No more problem. But now we have a question. And here's the question. Why could we not cast it out? Here's the need. Now, Jesus, you took care of the need. But here's our question. Why could we not cast it out? No doubt they had had answers to prayers before. They had ministered effectively at times. They had seen some success in their ministry as the disciples of Jesus. So what made this time different? Why could they not cast out this demon of epilepsy? I imagine their conversation with Jesus went something like this. Lord, we tried everything we knew to try. We prayed the way we heard you pray for people in times past. If you're Pentecostal, you would say this, Lord, we got louder and louder and louder. Because we all know as Pentecostals, the louder you pray, the more power there is in your prayer, right? That's just the Pentecostal inside of us. If you're Pentecostal, charismatic, you would say, Lord, we got louder and louder and louder, and we shook him more and more and more. Some of you haven't prayed over it before like that, haven't you? They yelled in your ear, and they shook you to death. And they were yelling and shaking, but you weren't feeling a thing, were you? You walked up there with that sickness, and you walked back with that sickness. Nothing changed. Listen, just because you can yell loud, pray loud, and shake hard and fast, doesn't mean you have any power in your life whatsoever. Doesn't mean a thing. That doesn't mean you have an ounce of the power of God in your life. Lord, why could we not cast it out of him? What went wrong? And I don't know about you this morning, but I have been in that place where the disciples have been many times. Why, Lord? Why? I have prayed for people that I know love God with all their heart. I know their life. I know how they care about the relationship of God. And yet the prayer goes unanswered. Why, Lord? Why? God, if you would just heal this person when they come up here this morning, it would blow the roof off of this place. Why, Lord? Why don't you do it? Why doesn't it happen? And Jesus answers their question in a way that they probably were not expecting for Jesus to answer the question. In fact, I love Jesus for that because he always answers in a way nobody expects him to answer. He tells them they need a little bit of faith. In fact, he says it's the size of a mustard seed. And you can move a mountain with a little bit of faith. But then in verse 21 of Matthew 17, he says this. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. 
Prayer connects you to God. Fasting disconnects you from the world. I want to say that again. I want you to get that this morning. Prayer connects you to God. Fasting disconnects you from the world. That's where the power is. When we fast, we are unplugging ourselves from the world, but we're plugging into a higher power, and that is the power of God. And that's why Jesus said it only comes through prayer and fasting. There are some times that you will pray a prayer of faith and a miracle will happen. We've been there. Many of us have seen that happen before. The prayer has been answered, a need has been met, and a situation has been turned around. But there are some needs that are especially great. There are some obstacles in our lives that have a whole different dimension of difficulty about them. Some things require a specific breakthrough in the heavenly realm. There are spiritual problems that are spiritually discerned, and they require spiritual prop power to break them. Now, whether you believe this or not, whether you want to believe this or not, it doesn't matter to me. I can only tell you what the Word of God says. And if the Word of God says this is what's happening, then I believe this is what's happening. I, I, a, I take the Word of God literally. I believe it says what it means, and it means what it says. It's a literal interpretation of the Word of God. Okay, that, that's, that's what we teach around this church. And here is what the Word of God says. Demonic powers are all around us. It's not the stuff that Hollywood makes up. It's not the stuff you see in the creepy horror movies. But there are demonic powers that are all around us. And here's what the Apostle Paul says. He said, our struggle... It's not against flesh and blood. You know, we do have some of those struggles from time to time, but that's not the main struggle. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is where our struggle is. What does that mean? That means that there are demonic forces around us at all times. And there is spiritual warfare and spiritual battle taking place in the heavenlies. Now, the heavenlies means it's places we can't see. You know, there's three levels of the heavenlies. There's the first and the third and second and the third level of the heavenlies. And in that third level of the heavenlies, where we can't see, there is demonic warfare and battle taking place. That's what the Apostle Paul said, right? There's powers, principalities, authorities, rulers in dark places, and there are forces of evil in heavenly realms. Now, you say, well, Pastor, I'm not sure I believe all that or not, but let's just go back to the Old Testament, back to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel writes about a time where he fasted for three weeks. He did a Daniel fast. There was a situation that he was fasting about. Let me stop and say this this morning. If there is a specific need, a specific situation, a specific illness or something in your life, I want you to fast about it for the next 21 days and pray about it. Because when you fast and pray specifically, you get the attention of God. Well, let me say this. You also get the attention of the enemy, of Satan, of the devil. When you enter this fast and prayer time, you will get the attention of the enemy as well because there are evil forces that are around us at all times trying to stop and hinder what God wants to do. The Bible says that Daniel fasted for three weeks over this situation. And suddenly, after three weeks of prayer and fasting, a man appeared to him. Daniel said the man was dressed in linen. He had a belt made of the finest gold around his waist. His face, Daniel said, was like lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. Man, his arms and legs were like bronze. And he said his voice was like the sound of a multitude of people. He told Daniel this. He said, Daniel, God has heard your prayers, and he has saw your fasting. And then he said, 
but the prince of the Persian kingdom. Now, if you're a note taker, write it down. A high-ranking demon, the prince of the Persian kingdom, resisted me 21 days. How long did Daniel fast? 21 days. For 21 days, he resisted me while you prayed and you fasted. But Daniel, God has heard your prayers, and God has seen you fasting. And Daniel, I have come to give you the answer that you need in your life. Don't tell me the devil's not real. The devil's real, and he will resist you, and he will come against you. But we serve a God that is greater than the devil is. We serve a God that is greater than all the demons of hell are. And no matter how much he resists, God will still send the answer. Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me because I was detained by the king of Persia. I just love this verse in the Bible because it makes it so real what is going on around us. So, Daniel, I tried to get to you, but I couldn't get through this high-ranking demon. He was powerful. He was strong. Listen, some of you have been praying about something for months and years, perhaps. Keep on praying about it. Keep on seeking God about it. Keep on believing God for a miracle. Keep on believing God for salvation. Keep on believing God for things to turn around in your life. Because when you least expect it, the answer might come through. And this, this angel with a gold belt and bronze arms and legs and flames for eyes and a booby voice said, Michael, the strong angel came and he helped defeat the enemy. And now I'm here to give you the answer to what you need. This was one of the clearest Old Testament examples of the demonic powers that oppose God's purposes and the earthly struggles that often reflect what is happening in the heavenlies and how prayer and fasting can affect the outcome. Nowhere in the Word of God are we told to be afraid ever in the Word of God. Nowhere in the Word of God are we told to cower and to run and hide from the forces of evil. Nowhere are we ever told that we cannot be overcomers in our lives. Jesus tells us that there is a way to obtain this power and to have a breakthrough in these areas. And it is through prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting release a spiritual power. Jesus knew what he was talking about. He had gone to the wilderness for 40 days of prayer and fasting. And let me tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said a total fast. He ate no food and drank no water. For 40 days. While he was gone into the wilderness. The Bible says after that time of prayer and fasting. Jesus returned in the power of the spirit. I want to tell you if you will take up the challenge this morning. And commit to prayer and fasting for 21 days. That you will begin to live in the power of the spirit. Your life will be different. Things will turn around. Things will be better. Jesus who the value of prayer and fasting. It is clear that he had been praying and fasting prior to the incident with the demon-possessed boy with epilepsy. He was ready for every occasion of life because he'd been praying and fasting. Some of you have been dealing with issues for months and problems and sicknesses and disease and issues, maybe even years. Crying over them will not give you the breakthrough that you need. Singing about them will not give you the breakthrough that you need. Talking to the pastor will not give you the breakthrough that you need. Reading books on the subject will not give you the breakthrough that you need. Jesus said this kind does not go out except through prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting show up in every nook and cranny of the Word of God and throughout church history. Let me tell you this. God tends to show up in his glory and his power whenever and wherever his people are set themselves to pray and fast before him. God will show up. I'm not going to read these passages. You may want to write them down if you're a note taker. Esther chapter 4. Queen Esther and all of Israel fasted for three days. Luke chapter 2. We read about an 84-year-old woman named Anna who lived in the temple. She fasted and prayed night and day, the Bible says. She recognized Jesus as the Messiah when Mary and Joseph brought him to the temple as a baby. In the book of Acts chapter 10, we read about Cornelius, the Roman centurion, who fasted for four days. 
he was visited by an angel and told the sin for Peter to come and to preach to him. Cornelius was the first Gentile convert to Christianity in history because he prayed and he fasted. We all know Jesus and Moses and Elijah fasted for 40 days. They did total fast for 40 days. There are many other examples of fasting in the Bible. It seems to show up when ordinary people like you and me need a supernatural power from God to overcome impossible odds, to overcome the enemies of our life, and to overcome the instructions the devil has placed before us. Historically, revival breaks out when the people of God pray and fast. You see pictures on the screen of great church leaders and great church followers, fathers from centuries ago. You should write those names down. And you should read about these men of God. Martin Luther, the great reformer, fasted. John Calvin fasted regularly, as did John Knox. All the great evangelists prayed and fasted. Charles Finney said that he had frequent days of fasting. He said that whenever he felt a spirit going down, the spirit weakening, he would go into a three-day fast. He would always end feeling recharged. History says that Finney would go into a city for a crusade. That when he got to the edge of town, that a spirit of conviction would fall upon the town. And people would begin to cry uncontrollably because of the power of God that he brought with him because of prayer and fasting. They said he would walk into a warehouse where men were working. And when he stepped foot into the warehouse, that men would fall out in the spirit of God. Because the power of God was so strong. And the anointing was so real in his life. When is the last time anyone ever felt the anointing of God come off of your life like that? When is the last time you walked into the presence of people and they could feel the anointing of God around you? They knew there was something different about you. Jonathan Edwards preached his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. People in the audience that day said they felt the ground open up and reveal the depths of hell. He combined fasting and prayer for that sermon. John Wesley believed in fasting. He fasted every Wednesday and Friday. He required anyone who wanted to minister with him to fast every Wednesday and Friday. You could not evangelize or pastor a church in his group if you did not do that. We see fasting and prayer combined with great leaders throughout church history. It is required and it is expected by Jesus. But we don't fast to earn something. We don't fast to lose weight. We don't fast to feel better about ourselves. We don't fast because everybody else is fasting. We fast to make a connection with our supernatural God. That is why we fast. I want to unplug from the world, and I want to plug into the power of God. That is why we are fasting for the next 21 days. Let me ask you this morning, are you ready to unleash the power of God in your life? Gail, yeah, we won't use that video this morning. Are you ready to receive fresh anointing in your life? Are you ready to see strongholds in your life broken? Are you ready to receive your miracle? Are you ready to receive power to break the habits in your life that you struggled with for years? Are you ready for that kind of power? In your sermon notes, you have some, those very same statements there this morning. You may just want to circle yes or no beside of those things. Yes, I'm ready to unleash the power of God in my life. Yes, I want to receive fresh anointing in my life. Yes, I want to see strongholds working. Yes, I want to receive a miracle. Yes, I need to break these old habits. Yes, I need to see God move in my life. Well, it's apparent that everyone here this morning will not participate in our 21-day fast. I hope that you will seriously consider doing it. It will make a difference in your life if you will commit to it. And what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to ask our ushers to come. If you were here last Sunday, you got one of these papers, but that, don't even worry about last Sunday. This is a new day. They're going to pass out to you what we call our fasting contract. If you can't commit to the 21-day Daniel fast, maybe you can commit to giving up technology, as we've already said. Maybe you can commit to giving up a specific food item. Maybe you can commit to giving up your favorite television show for the next 21 days. 
I don't know what it is. But we just talk about connecting to God. And whatever you have to unplug in your life to connect to God, that's what we want you to unplug. And so I want you to take this contract. There's a pen in front of everybody's seat. And I want you to fill this contract out again, even if you did it last week. And I'm going to fill mine out with you this morning. Again today, it's going to end on the 23rd. Now when you fill it out, I just want you to fold it, and I want you to tear that bottom piece off. The top portion is yours. Whether you're doing the, the Daniel fast with food or some other thing, the Lord may have impressed you this morning. I just want you to tear it off. You can fold it. speaking of prayer and fasting one time Jesus said that when you pray and fast you are to anoint your head with oil you're to wash your face in other words you're not to look like you're sick like you're sad like you're mad you just look like you always look keep yourself clean and neat There's something about oil in the Word of God. Oil is associated with healing and joy and anointing. But oil also represents the presence of God in our lives throughout the Bible. So whatever it is you've chosen to give up for the next 21 days, I want you to sign that contract. I want you to tear it off. And we're going to do something maybe a little out of the ordinary this morning. We're going to physically anoint you and bless you as you prepare for this 21 days of fasting and prayer this morning. Even if you're not going to do the Daniel fast that we have outlined to do for whatever reason that may be, we still want to anoint you and pray for you for the next 21 days that God will bless you during this time. So we're just seated this morning. I'm just going to ask you for just a moment to bow your head with me. I'd like you to take that contract in your hand and just hold it there. And I want you to think about whatever it is you need in your life, whatever's going on. Maybe there's a situation. Maybe there's a problem. Maybe there's a sickness. Maybe there's a need. You're specifically going to fast and pray about that for the next 21 days. You're believing God for a miracle. You believe God's going to show up in a real way. Father, we commit this congregation to you now for the next 21 days of prayer and fasting. Lord, we're not doing this to be seen by anybody else. We're not doing this, Lord, to receive any earthly glory like the Pharisees did. We're not doing this for anyone else but ourselves. Lord, I don't know every need in this room today. I don't know every burden that is being carried. I don't know every sickness. I don't know every financial need. I don't know every relational need. Lord, you know everything about us. And we are committing to dedicate ourselves to you 
for the next 21 days. We believe that miracles will take place. We believe that strongholds will be broken. We believe that old habits will go away. We believe, Lord, that you will move in this congregation as an entire body and as individuals in a special way for the next 21 days. We believe you're going to change us. I pray, God, that as we begin this fast and as we go forward with it, that as we enter our workplaces and we enter the places we shop and we enter the schools that we go to, we enter into our neighborhoods, that, God, your presence will go with us and people will sense something different about us, that they will know that we have been in the very presence of God because of this time of prayer and fast. Bless your people, Lord. I pray blessing upon those who will do, be doing the Daniel fast for 21 days. I pray for those who you've spoken to and they will be sacrificing something else for the next 21 days. Whatever it is, God, it's not about what we do, but it's about the spirit that we do it in. Bless your people, Lord. Bless this church, I pray. In Jesus' name. What I'd like to ask you to do is I'd like to invite you to stand this morning all over the house. I'm going to ask the, the brethren to come. They're going to be anointing this morning to take their place. And all we want you to simply do is to step out to your left, come forward, drop your fasting contract in one of these baskets. And we're going to anoint you. We're not going to pray. We're just going to anoint you and bless you this morning. And then we're just going to end our service this way. When you're anointed and blessed, you can just go back to your seat. You can go there and pray, or you can just exit the service, however you feel comfortable doing that. We're going to pray, and we're going to anoint you this morning with oil. Would you come this time? You're ready to turn your life around for the next 21 days. This is your day. This is your moment. and keep you for the next 21 days.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.